Those of you who read Three Cups of Tea, you know it starts out with a, my youngest sister, Krista. And Krista was a very special girl. It was because she suffered from severe epilepsy. And for those the students here, epilepsy is a disease when you have seizures. Sometimes your eyes roll back or you start shaking. And it's really scary because you don't know when you're going to get a seizure. It might be in classroom or, you know, sitting in the, uh, the dining hall. And what uh, Krista, she never complained. She would take an hour or two the night before school. She'd pack her bags. She'd get her lunch ready. She'd get her clothes ready. I'm kind of the five-minute bed-to-bus kind of guy. <laughs> Anyways, in 1992, Krista saw the baseball movie called Field of Dreams. It's a beautiful movie about a boy who has a dream to build a baseball field in the middle of a cornfield in Iowa, and his heroes will come and play a game. So she decided for her 23rd birthday to celebrate by going to Dyersville, Iowa, and seeing where the movie was filmed. She packed her bags, but when my mother went to wake up Krista, July 24th, 1992, Krista died in her sleep from a massive seizure. And we were very devastated. Krista was very dear to us. So I decided to climb K2, the world's second highest mountain, and put an amber necklace on top of the mountain in honor of my sister Krista. Um, do you know what um, amber is? You know, do you want to tell us what amber is? Okay. It's a type of rock. Very good. And um, what color is amber? Is it? It's like kind of goldish and yellowy. Very good. It's a type of rock from tree sap. It's kind of goldish and yellowy. Give her a big round. Good job. High five. <laughs> there we go. Okay, thank you. And so finally, a year later, I went to Pakistan to climb K2. This is the Karakora mountain range, the greatest consolidation of high peaks in the world. There are 64 peaks above 6,500 meters in a 150-kilometer area. Just to, I don't know what, what city is about 150 kilometers from um, top Toronto? New Buffalo. Or what? Anyways, imagine seeing dozens of peaks that high. Um, this is K2, the world's second highest mountain. The first attempt, uh, 84 Matterhorns can be put inside of K2 to fill it up. The first attempt was 101 years ago, the Duke of Abruzzi, an Italian gentleman. He reached halfway up on the right-hand side. He was wearing hobnail boots. And being a gentleman, he wore a tweed jacket and a tie while he climbed. <laughs> he was eating cans of sardines. This is an avalanche. And just to give you a scale of this, if you look way down in the right foreground, you can see four little blue tents. And if you have a magnifying glass, you can see four Spanish men in their underwear running out of the tents very quickly. <laughs> Unfortunately, nobody was killed in this avalanche. This is uh, the West Ridge of K2. On the left-hand side is China, and the right-hand side is Pakistan. We worked our way up the mountain. But finally, 78 days later, it was time to go home. I didn't quite make it to the top. My two partners did summit. And what, to me, was the most difficult part was going home with Krista's amber necklace in my pocket. So those of you who read Three Cups of Tea, can anyone here, without cheating now, can anybody tell me what the first chapter is called in Three Cups of Tea? Look at this. It's always the kid. You know, I was in the U.S., 5,000 adults, not one person. Remember that? Today, I was speaking at schools, and every single, nearly every child remembers the name of the first chapter. So um, tell us, what is the first chapter called? The first chapter is called Failure. Very good. Give her a big round. Failure. Thank you. <laughs> What's your name? Megan said failure. One more time, I'll pick on the publisher, but when I submitted the original manuscript to New York, they said, Greg, in America, you never start a book with the word failure. <laughs> but you know what? We all make mistakes, and we all fail. Some of us burn cookies in the oven. Some of us fail to return books to the library on Prime. <laughs> Some of us forget to pay our library dues and fees. Um, some of us fail in our relationships. I was in Wall Street in New York in March, and I mentioned that some of us fail in our investments, and nobody laughed there. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you fail, think of this very beautiful Persian proverb that says, when it is dark, you can see the stars. So I had to leave K2. I had to walk about 85 kilometers. I was carrying about 120 kgs. And finally, I stumbled into a little village called Corfe. I have now worked for 17 years, just slow down a little bit, in, in rural Afghanistan and Pakistan, and I've learned a few things. One out of three children born dies before the age of one. The female literacy rate is about 2 to 5%. Half the men leave the villages to get jobs in the cities. 
But who's left behind? It's the women. And the women tell me their workload has doubled now in the last two, three decades. One day I walked behind the village and I saw 84 children sitting in the dirt during their school lessons. There were five boys, five girls and 79 boys, and most of the children were riding with a stick in the sand. And although I had seen a lot of poverty in Africa, when I saw those kids, it really touched me. And as I looked around, I didn't see any teacher there. Now, can you imagine going to your school, no teacher there for half a week because they couldn't afford his daily $1 salary? And I also saw the older children helping younger, the mentor, mentoring the younger children. You know, today we are trying to solve something called poverty. We haven't done a poverty bailout yet, but you know, we've, we've, we're trying to solve poverty. But the only way we can solve poverty is that we have to touch poverty, and we have to smell poverty, and we have to taste poverty, and we have to hear poverty. We can never solve poverty from a think tank in Washington, D.C. or um, Ottawa. Is that right? <laughs> Anyways, um, and to me, what is most inspiring is as I visit schools around the country, and now in Canada, there's a phenomena going on in our schools and many other places, and that's called community service, or service learning, or civic engagement. There was a US News and World Report that said that in 19, um, 20 years ago, only 18% of college graduates said, I want to go out and make my community or the world a better place. Today, it's 50%, 50%. And if you look at higher education, there's been a the revolution in higher education. Political science has turned into international relations. Engineering and architecture is looking at sustainable engineering. Medicine and nursing is looking at holistic health rather than just symptomatic treatment of diseases. Business is looking at ethical entrepreneurship. Just imagine had we start studying that 10 years ago. Anyways, um, um, and a lot of that is because of the increase in community service in schools. I was very heartened uh, the last couple of days I, I, when I've talked to students in the Toronto schools, the number of students involved in community service in Canada is double from that of the U.S., you know, just on a very rough average. In the U.S., it might be 40, 30 percent. Here in Canada, it's about 80 percent. And these might be very small things, um, picking up garbage, planting a tree, helping a younger child learn how to read and write, or maybe helping an elderly person, or maybe uh, recycling or getting involved in, in uh, you know, maybe helping out the library a little bit. Anyways, um, but I think that's a very powerful catalyst, and, and we need to recognize that there, there's some really wonderful things happening. Well, I left Pakistan. I had to raise $12,000 to build a school. I had no clue how to fundraise, and I've received a lot of flack for this, but what I did is I went to the local library. My father always taught me, you go to the library, and as a child, I didn't have a library. I, I only had the Encyclopedia Britannica and the National Geographic. That was all, all the books I had growing up, pretty much. And so, are there any librarians in here? or in the other room. Okay, let's give them all a big round. Give the librarians a big round. I love librarians. So the librarians and I, we looked up the name of 580 celebrities and movie stars and sports heroes. At the time, I didn't know how to use a computer, so I hand typed 580 letters. Dear Michael Jordan, or Dear Wayne Gretzky. I didn't write him a letter, but anyways, guess what happened? Nothing happened. And then at Christmas time, I got one check back from Tom Brokow, the newscaster. Well, Tom has been a big help with three cups of tea. He wrote a blurb on the front. But he's also kind of avoiding me lately. And recently, Tom has moved to Montana, where I live. And he had us, we've uh, met a few times. And so I asked Tom, why are you avoiding me? He said, well, Greg, I'm kind of embarrassed because everywhere I go, people pull me aside, ask about this three cups of tea thing. And I'm really embarrassed because I only wrote you a $100 check and you wrote about it and stuck it in the book. <laughs> now, I didn't quite have the guts to say, Tom, you know, you can still write another check and we'll put it in the next book. <laughs> but anyways, thank you, Tom, for your help. And to add some insult to that, my daughter, Amira, she's 13. We were doing homework the other night. But she was kind of distracted and she looked up at me and said, Daddy, I figured out that in 1993, you spent $128 on postage and you only raised $100. <laughs> Not very good. <laughs> That's what education does for you. Well, I kept working and working to get this school funded. And one day, my mother, who's an elementary school principal in Wisconsin, invited me to come and talk to the kids. It was the first time I'd spoken to anybody, adults or kids. And I'm actually quite a shy guy. I was very frightened and nervous to go talk to some kids. 